Our economic system is underpinned by the natural world and the stability and resilience it provides. But we've taken it for granted. Ecosystems are assets. We are really talking about an asset management problem. Our finance sector has unwittingly bankrolled the destruction of the very natural systems it relies upon. And the problem with climate change is that it's not a quarterly issue, it's a quarter century issue. We will have to understand what the impact of our investment decisions are. The financial system is not doing a great job of distinguishing between good and bad growth. Putting ourselves on a trajectory to devastate the natural world and our way of life forever. The impact of climate change and nature loss can no longer be ignored. This becomes increasingly difficult to predict into the future and even more complex to ensure. Humanity now stands at an unprecedented crossroads. If we don't improve our relationship with nature, it's not just the financial system that's in jeopardy, but every other system to which we belong, including life itself. This film will reveal that as we rebuild our economies in the shadow of a devastating global pandemic, the finance sector has a crucial role to play in creating a thriving and resilient economy that moves away from funding the things that are destroying our world. Finance is the function to put the money behind the people who deliver change. To funding those that will ensure a stable future for humanity and all life on our planet. The financial sector is an enormously powerful and effective force and can be a force for good. The extraordinary natural world we see today is very different from the one inhabited by our early ancestors. Human beings first appeared around 200,000 years ago. They had no need for money or complex trade. The natural world then was unstable. Living conditions fluctuated dramatically over short periods of time. But then, approximately 10,000 years ago, something truly remarkable happened. The climate stabilized. The natural system that we were living in, filled with billions of individuals, of millions of different plants and animals had evolved into something extraordinarily complex and interconnected. Able to supply us with fresh water, abundant fish and meat, timber to build our homes and to keep us warm, fertile land, pollinators for our crops, even able to regulate the seasons and bring dependable rains. By working so efficiently, absorbing carbon from the atmosphere, recycling nutrients and water, the bewildering variety of life helped to bring stability to our restless planet. It was this that made the ecosystems resilient and gave us the services of nature that we rely upon. Everything that happens to us, everything we experience, is built on the processes that nature offers. It's nutrient cycling, filtering of water. I can't think of anything that we do which is not founded on nature's processes. All of these processes and services that nature provides for free have allowed us to thrive. On nature's shoulders, we built our civilizations and thought it could replenish everything we extracted. Right up until the middle of the last century, 
we lived within the limits of our planet. Although wealth was unequally shared, our collective impact was at a sustainable level. Then, post-World War II, the modern world really got underway. This was the start of the Great Acceleration. Our pressure on the natural world changed from being linear to becoming exponential. Humanity's progress gave billions of people around the world access to healthcare and higher standards of living. Many of us have never had it so good. But at the same time, the planet has never had it so bad. During my lifetime, the human population has more than trebled. Our use of energy globally has increased eightfold. And the global wilderness has been almost halved. We have moved from a small species on a big planet to a species so dominant that our impacts rival the forces of nature. As we have taken control of the planet and started to overconsume, the systems we have built drain the oceans of so many fish that fish stocks are collapsing. Strip mangroves away, leaving coastlines exposed to erosion and flooding. Continue to clear the most biodiverse habitats for timber, soy and food production. Replace wild herds and healthy soils with industrial-scale farms and intensive agriculture. Impede the world's largest rivers. Systems which burn greenhouse gases in such quantities that they pollute the clean air, melt ice caps and overheat an entire planet. The financial sector has been too slow to recognise the negative impacts it has on our society and our environment. Since the Paris Accord was signed in 2015, banks globally have continued to invest 1.9 trillion US dollars into the fossil fuel industry, and that's despite knowing where that's leading and what the consequences are. Where the natural system brought stability, the human systems we have built and financed are creating instability. During the space of a single human lifetime, my lifetime, we have changed the planet so much that the benign, stable conditions which underpinned both the growth of our civilizations and the trade and financial systems that you preside over have ended. Flaws in the finance system have helped tarnish our natural world. Our financial system has been oriented to focus on very short-term profit, on tracking an index, more passive investment, all at the expense of our long-term future. Our economic and financial systems prioritizes GDP and ignores to a large degree, environmental and social externalities, causing huge damage to our planet and to the wider society. Since nature is bounded, it's finite, it must be that the picture of unlimited growth possibilities is wholly flawed. It's not just, it's unreal. It is bizarre. If we continue to ignore the physical limitations of the resources and services we depend on, we will push the planet to catastrophic points of no return. Economists are no strangers to tipping points, as those who have studied the 2008 crash know all too well. 
what essentially happened in 2008 was that belief and trust suddenly evaporated. <laughs> Investors almost overnight woke up and realized that all these flashy subprime mortgages in America and thought were worth something suddenly weren't. And that created a panic which fed on itself. Filed the biggest bankruptcy in US history. The result was a global shock followed by economic collapse. No bailout for Lehman Brothers. Yet the flaws in the finance systems which led to this continue today. We didn't learn all that we could have from the 2008 financial crisis. In fact, our financial system is still largely incentivizing behaviors and norms which are causing destruction to our, our natural world and our planet. But recent experience has shown us that global shocks caused by externalities, such as pandemics, can be even more devastating. If the global pandemic teaches us one thing, it's that we certainly cannot ignore the signs from science when they start flashing red. Some knew about the potential risks of a global health pandemic, but we didn't do enough as a global community to prepare for it in advance. The results of ignoring the warnings have been huge. Many lives have been lost. Most of the world stopped. And it has cost the global economy trillions of dollars, pushing it into a worldwide recession. Both the 2008 crash and the global pandemic painfully demonstrate our vulnerability to global shocks. But there is a difference between these crises and what's coming. The threat from climate change and biodiversity loss is existential. Unlike the pandemic, we can't self-isolate from their effects. After the 2008 financial crisis and COVID-19, as we see right now, our financial system could ultimately be rebuilt. But when nature starts to fall apart, it's a completely different situation. We go through a series of one-way doors and through irreversible tipping points. What is dawning on all of us is that the economic numbers are telling us that climate change is happening now in our lifetime. The devastating effects of climate change cannot be ignored. As we push our planet to irreversible ecological tipping points, global shocks could become more regular and much, much worse. And the tipping points are looming. Factory farming is the biggest driver of global deforestation. Ninety-one percent of Amazonian deforestation is a result of livestock production. Scientists tell us that the Amazon rainforest is approaching an unstoppable transformation into a drier savanna, which will be catastrophic, turning it from a carbon sink to a carbon emitter. This will ultimately disrupt the flow of rain to South America's valuable agricultural areas, devastating economies, investments, and people's lives. The soils of the frozen north are already starting to thaw. If this continues, they will release their locked up methane. Any chance of controlling the climate will be lost. Huge cities such as Cape Town and Chennai have already come close to running out of water. Ocean acidification and heating will decimate even more coral reefs around the globe. Closely followed by the collapse of many fishing industries and coastal tourism. Continuing overuse of fertilizers and pesticides will kill off soil microorganisms and pollinators destroying farmland and future harvests. Disease outbreaks and pandemics may be more regular, 
and could spread faster. And all of this threatens the services nature provides us for free. The natural services that we take for granted, like clean water, fresh air, and healthy soil, provide us a value of more than $125 trillion per year. That's over one and a half times global annual GDP. These ecosystem services do more than ensure a stable world and power our industries. They also cushion us against global shocks. The likely scenario we face today, if we breach through these tipping points, is that our financial and economic system, as we know them today, will simply cease to exist. But our future doesn't have to be this way. As a family man, I do wonder what kind of world we will leave to our children. I do hope that we'll be able to say to them that we did enough when we could. The glimmer of hope right now is that we have just a few years to really make impactful change towards a sustainable future. Right now, as economies grapple with the impacts of the pandemic, the finance sector is at a pivotal moment. As we re-examine the future of work and the future of travel, we can choose to build an improved financial and economic system that works for both people and the planet. So we shouldn't lose this opportunity because now we will have the attention of the financial sector. And no sector is better placed to drive the transition to a sustainable economy and a stable future than the finance sector itself. To achieve this, our finance system needs systemic change. And now is the time to be brave and ambitious. We need to start with the concept of thriving humanity on a thriving planet and then ask what kind of financial system would actually be in service to that, in service to thriving life. And it's a very, very different one from what we have today. There's over 300 trillion in the global capital markets and that money can be harnessed to do a great deal of good. Scientists predict we have just 10 years to make the changes we need to try to ensure a stable future. So building a better system can start today with five key actions. As we move to a sustainable economy, all companies, banks and investors will need to understand where they are vulnerable. To prevent more global shocks, we need a system that better accounts for all risk. There's the reputational risk of not being seen to act on climate change or financing things that are creating other environmental or social consequences. There's the physical risks, you know, what will flooding, uh, wildfires uh, and many other major events mean for the portfolios of banks. We are already starting to feel the effects of some of these physical risks. Insured losses from weather-related events over the last decade are $63 billion annually. What is even more alarming is that uninsured losses are larger than this number. And this is before counting the unquantifiable loss of human life. Currently, the brunt is being borne by the poorest people in the world. Soon, these effects will manifest in every society on the planet. If sea levels rise, the value of properties on the coastline in places like Florida will suddenly decline. 
That has a lot of implications for anyone lending a mortgage. The Economist Intelligence Unit estimated that the present value at risk to a future world that might be six degrees warmer, say at the end of the century, $43 trillion would be wiped off the stock of capital if we hit that scenario. So physical risk is potentially profound. Many governments are attempting to prevent runaway climate change by creating legally binding net zero carbon targets to keep the planet ideally within 1.5 degrees of warming. As companies adapt to meet these global targets, they will also face transitional risks. Most financial assets are affected by the fact that carbon price is going up in certain jurisdictions. The auto sector has to adjust to new fuel regulations, renewable power is coming on. Um, they need to manage the risks around the transition to the type of economy that we're headed, which is net zero by 2050. But we will only achieve these longer term targets for climate and nature if we take bold and urgent action now. The biggest risk is inaction, inaction today. If we continue to downplay the scale of the transition that needs to happen across the entire economy, across all economies around the world, then the adjustment when it comes will be much more severe. And so suddenly businesses have to think, in 10 years time, nobody's going to want to touch coal. So why am I putting millions and millions of dollars into this plant when it's going to be stranded in, let's say, a decade? Almost a trillion dollars of turnover in publicly listed companies is dependent on commodities linked to deforestation. So investors should be worried about those companies that do rely on deforestation because those companies are going to become a stranded asset. In the terminology, uh, it would be a climate Minsky moment, a sudden realization that enormous change uh, needs to happen in a very short period of time. Uh, and that's what we need to avoid, which is why we need to start moving today. The real question is, how do you make the transition happen? How can we be stewards of the transition to a low carbon economy? Failing to act on these risks now could leave institutions open to a further risk. Businesses that have a significant causation for climate change and other environmental issues may face litigation. And banks that don't react and take responsibility may also face litigation themselves. As companies better account for risks from climate change and biodiversity loss, and work to mitigate these risks, we will be protecting our investments and our businesses, as well as reducing pressure on the planet. If we wait, it will be too late. The best way to avoid these risks is to halt the negative impacts of our investments and lending. Science tells us that over the next decade, we need to halve our greenhouse gas emissions, halt the destruction of nature, and invest in restoring the natural capital that drives our economies. So every decision made in the finance industry results in real world impacts of some nature in nature. The finance system has the ability to dial up the positive and drastically dial down the negative impacts of every decision made. 
Sustainable banking partly means not financing the things that are causing environmental harm and will not serve us in the long term, but it also means doing the more progressive stuff and investing your time and energy and resources into things that, if we continue to finance those, will serve us forever. To achieve this, we need transparency and understanding of our impacts. ESG, or Environmental, Social and Governance Reporting, should be the bare minimum for all companies. ESG captures the idea that we really think about the risks, the financial risks, arising from neglecting to look at the impact we make on the environment and on society when we make financial decisions. So it's great, ESG is great, but it's quite narrowly conceived at the moment. We need to go much further. ESG is a good first step, but we need to ensure that impact from all lending and investment is positive for people and positive for planet. When the finance sector requires that companies demonstrate sustainability, it will be using its power to drive change. What we need is for financial institutions to demonstrate and report on how they are reducing their impact on the natural world. Otherwise, principles risk being meaningless. Those responsible companies that start accurately reporting and reducing their impact and risks will thrive. Those that don't will be left behind. The reason sustainable companies will benefit is simple. Humanity en masse is starting to care deeply about the planet. We need to recognise that investors, customers, employees, all stakeholders are changing. This is the real generational shift that my children actually saying, what can I actually do in order to make a difference. And they're finding that answer in what they wear, they're finding it in what they eat, they're finding it in how they travel. And I think the big new revelation is they're gonna find it in where they put and where they invest their money. There will be a time when we will look back and ask ourselves what we did right now. How do we want to be remembered? A recent study found that 8 in 10 US individual investors and 9 in 10 millennial investors expressed an interest in sustainable investing. Amazingly, by 2030, millennial investors will hold five times more wealth than they do today. And they're looking at investments that align to their values, that align to the climate and nature emergency. But if enough people are pushing for change, then change will come. And we are those people. And every single person counts. So there's a really interesting shift, and I hear this from people who work in finance. They say, we've got new clients. It's either grandpa who's thinking about his legacy, or it's his granddaughter who's saying, grandpa, what the heck have you been doing? And that sandwich of moral pressure is actually opening up new demand in the financial sector to come up with financial portfolios that don't just extract revenue, but that invest in the future. Very soon, pensions worth trillions of dollars could become the front line of sustainable investing. Most people don't even know where their pensions or investment products are invested in. Often these are invested in fossil fuel companies or companies causing deforestation. It's quite a tragic irony because these are the very things destroying the future that people are ultimately saving for. Some of the world's leading asset owners have spotted the risks of business as usual and are demanding that their fund managers invest more sustainably. Nobody told me how to hedge the risk like a climate change. So I thought that we have to take a totally different approach uh, for, to manage that risk. And then we came up with the, uh, several new concepts. So the philosophy behind everything we do is the, uh, the long-term investment and the, uh, the universal ownership. And we thought 
for the capital market to be sustainable, environment must be sustainable. So everything related to the, uh, the environment or like a society, all of a sudden became a portfolio management issue. Capitalism will become sustainable when the individual who has the money exercises their right to ensure that that money is invested in a way that they are perfectly comfortable with. And it's not just investors who are demanding change. It's employees too. Every day I get questions from my colleagues across the bank in different pockets of, of activity everywhere they are asking how can they be helpful? How can they be part of this, this movement? How can they help the bank be more sustainable? Ultimately, we will be able to attract and keep the best talent only if we are showing up in a way that is purposeful and sustainable as a business. We're seeing a shift in attitudes. People care about climate change. Our people want to work for a company that has a purpose that is clear on sustainability. I think this gives us a competitive advantage in attracting and retaining people. As more people realise they have choices over where to put their savings and to pressure the companies they choose to work for, demand for sustainable investments and sustainable businesses will grow. This changing financial landscape heralds the end of business as usual, but brings with it an exciting world of new opportunities. Whenever a tree dies in a forest, new opportunities arise for those that are ready to take them. In the same way, opportunities are now arising in the global economy, as more and more countries are committing to a net zero future. Achieving net zero requires a whole economy transition. Every company, every bank, insurer, investor will have to adjust their business models. But doing so could turn an existential risk into the greatest commercial opportunity of our time. This dilemma people think that environmental responsibility is at the, the cost of profit is a false one. And what you'll see emerging over time is that the more profitable banks and financial institutions will be the ones that have the highest levels of environmental and social consciousness. Environmentally responsible opportunities are everywhere. The clean energy sector is already exploding. We've seen disruptive technologies in the auto industry creating a huge amount of value. There are uh, potentially disruptive technologies uh, for shipping or uh, air transport, whether that's hydrogen in those cases. Uh, there are disruptive technologies actually to help uh, moderate the amount of greenhouse gases in the environment, such as direct uh, air carbon capture. Over the next decade, approximately $95 trillion is needed for global infrastructure. Done right, investment could improve the health of our planet and the health of our citizens, such as building cities of the future that work with nature, not against it. The idea of Sponge City is allow the natural flow to come back. Use a wetland system, use a sponge system to retain the water, to keep the water, instead of drain away. I want to show people that green solution works. From that one city 20 years ago, now we have 250 Chinese cities having us doing projects. Investments in reinsurance and insurance number in the trillions of dollars. These investments can be transitioned to support sustainable business. In addition, insurance companies can move to manage risks that are not detrimental to our planet. The entire food sector is also transforming. 
in what people are choosing to eat. For the first time since the Green Revolution happened 60 years ago, there is another revolution happening in protein production. Within a decade, alternative meat proteins are expected to grab over 10% of the 1.4 trillion meat market. And in how we grow food sustainably for expanding urban populations. The role of finance is to provide capital to the people who have great ideas or the people who try to build the future. Right? And uh, so we are kind of the accelerator for those uh, change makers. Over the next decade, an estimated $68 trillion will be passed in the great wealth transfer. From baby boomers to millennials, who value the impact of their investments as much as the financial returns from them. This is an extraordinary opportunity to align with the aspirations of the new generation. Taking society and the environment into account in all our financial decisions will soon be business critical. Fortunately for the finance sector, the opportunities and benefits are endless. We know that the financial and economic system must change to reach a sustainable future. We just need the collective will to do it. The value we place on a stable natural world will ultimately determine its future. Do we invest money in the practices that take us deeper into this crisis or in the solutions that could get us out of it? With trillions of dollars in assets, there is an unmissable opportunity for the finance sector to not only ride the wave of change, but to direct and accelerate it. The public needs you to take the lead and needs you to be brave. Other CIO told me uh, our job is to save money, not to save the planet. But I can't argue saying like, uh, what's the point of receiving a pension when our children cannot even play outside? Revolutions happen when the majority of people think that it's a mistake to try and block change. And I think we're almost at that tipping point right now. We need to get together and bring the experts in banking, in insurance, in securities investment, in central banking. We need to bring them all together and ensure that each of their expertise is deployed collectively in a way that rethinks and re-engineers capital markets. And as with the pandemic, building a sustainable finance sector and healthy planet will need a global response. The finance sector plays a crucial role in the fight against climate change, but it cannot do it alone. We need a coordinated response across many sectors, government, energy, technology, the legislative and regulatory environment, bringing all these together to make a meaningful impact against climate change. So what might the future finance sector look like? I think that ultimately to bring about the kind of transformation we need for a finance system that truly serves society, we will need a finance industry that is conscious of its impact, tracking its impact, and has actually got a mandate to invest and finance activity that's regenerative rather than disruptive. How can money work for us instead of us working for money? How can money help us get more of the thing we wanted to begin with, which wasn't money, it was value. The new finance system will direct capital with a different set of goals. 
it will be recalibrated to creating long-term value, which is based on transparency, so all investors can see what their money is funding. It will integrate climate, nature and social responsibility into all financial decisions. It will stop funding businesses that destroy rather than restore nature. Come to value biodiversity and invest in nature's services to help build the resilience that our economy and humanity wants and needs. The thing that gives me hope is that people are rethinking how capitalism should be structured at the top table. It's huge. And if they're successful, then we will live in a much more sustainable future. If they do not succeed, then the economies will collapse and civilization itself is at risk. At this moment, as we navigate our way through the biggest economic crisis since the Second World War, we are still facing the existential threat of biodiversity loss and climate change. When you pull the bottom out of an economy, when you take away the resources that are fueling not only every bit of commerce and every bit of economic activity we have, but our livelihoods and our basic human needs, it really brings it in stark contrast to everything that we've faced to date. And that is why this is so important. That is why banks need to care. That's why all of us need to care. This is the moment to build a new and fair system, reframe our idea of value, and better safeguard ourselves from future global shocks. If we do this, we'll be leaving a proud legacy. A healthy planet, one that our children can rely on. Which side of history will you be on? I'm tired of hearing excuses. This is the most well-educated and the most well-paid industry. And I'll be disappointed if we cannot change ourselves.